Good morning, everyone. Good day and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. You are very welcome to this webinar on a new book in the Channel Views Future of Tourism series entitled Science Fiction, Disruption and Tourism. Next slide, please. My name is Una mcmahon Beatty. I am one of the book editors, along with Ian Newman and Mariana Sagala, and it is my pleasure to welcome you and to chair this session today. So you might ask, what is the purpose of the book? Well, it recreates and invents the future of tourism in a creative and disruptive manner, reconceptualizing tourism uh, through alternative and quantum leap thinking that goes beyond the accepted view of tourism. Much um, of tourism research, we might say, is imaginable, feasible and evidence-based. Science fiction, on the other hand, in many ways, is unimaginable, impossible, radical and disruptive. And it's this sort of thinking that can help us in disruptive times and in the, those disruptive times that we are currently living in, hence the book. And we hope that this session will give you a flavour of that thinking. So some housekeeping, folks. Each speaker will speak for 10 minutes and uh, the slides will be moved on. So you will hear um, the speakers asking for it next slide. The session will be recorded and registered attendees will receive a link to the recording in due course, which you will be able to access on YouTube. The webinar allows attendees to ask questions at any time using a chat function under the Q&A, though the Q&A round will be at the end of all the presentations. Attendees are able to upvote questions indicating popular questions. You will not have the ability to unmute yourselves or ask questions verbally during the webinars. But during the Q&A session, I will be responsible for asking questions from the Q&A box. Next slide, please. So the book is the seventh title in the Future of Tourism series published by Channel View. And it is an important one in the context of a disruptive changing world that we live in. All attendees have access to a discount offer of 40% of all the books in the Tourism Future series with the code FOT2022. And that's at the Channel View website. And that offer is valid until the end of March. Next slide, please. So it is my pleasure to introduce five thought-provoking speakers, all of whom are contributors to the books or to the book. Therefore, it will give you a flavor of the book. Each speaker has 10 minutes. And uh, there, as I said before, there'll be a Q&A session at the end. So we have Ian Newman, who's an associate professor at Victoria University of Wellington. Ian is an advocate for the future of tourism and New Zealand's number one Sunderland fan. He will be exploring the central contribution of the book, which lies in the theoretical framework it presents for exploring a future of tourism based on science fiction. Leon Gervich is also an associate professor at Victoria University of Wellington. He uses a design theory perspective which intertwines media, tourism, futures and design to explore the disruptive potential of technology to deliver experiences and the desire of tourists to feel free from moral, social, economic and political constraints in their daily lives. Maria McEntee is uh, acting head of Department of Hospitality and Tourism Management at Ulster University in Northern Ireland. Maria is going to explore the idea of tourists as a plague of zombies within the context of sustainability. Next slide, please. Emily Hocker is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Lapland in Finland. Emily uses a narrative approach, asking you to imagine a typical day in the life of a tourist, exploring the idea of environmental crises as something that we assume we will have to face in the future. And lastly, Mariana Sagala is professor at the University of Paris in Greece. She will explore how we can use science fiction as a thinking machine or a means to find new forms of tourism and realizing that the future of tourism is not the same as the past, and how it may require new ways of conceptualizing the future. So I'm going to hand over to Ian first. Ian? Sorry, Ian, we can't hear you. Good morning, New Zealand. Good morning, Ulster. Um, good morning, Finland, and good morning, the world. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, Basically, 
we started this book oh, th three years ago, four years ago. That's when we came up with the idea. And basically, right at the heart of why you're going to do something is it's where your passion is. And I've always been a passionate person about science fiction. You know, I grew up with Captain Kirk in Star Trek, uh, Logan's Run, Soil and Green, and Robbie the Robot. So, and there was always something in those science fiction films which had a grain of truth with them. And I think somebody once said to me, if you look at the old series of Star Trek, the original one from the 1960s, 1968, everything in there has probably come true in the terms of, you know, the telecommunicator, which is the flip phone, um, the, 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 the teledeck, um, which is virtual reality. Um, they've all sort of come true and there's a, there's a resonance with them today. So I've always had this seed in me about science fiction, and then you become an academic. And what does it mean? Next slide, please. So to start off with, if you look at some of the films of science fiction and some of the books to do with science fiction, they've always got that link. And um, I always, a number of films resonated with me in the terms of COVID-19 and where that was. So if you read Dean Kutzen's book, The Eyes of Darkness, you know, that was a book from the 1980s. And right at the center of that book is um, there's this virus that escapes from a laboratory in China called Wuhan 400. But unfortunately, it's not like COVID-19. Everybody that gets that virus are turned into zombies and they all die. So it's not quite it's not quite the same. But if you look at other films about outbreak and contingent, very much those replicated pandemics and epidemics of what go goes on. And when you look at those authors and what they've written, they basically look, look, they looked at COVID-19, they looked at SARS-1, they looked at that type of thing and said, what would this, what would this mean in a science fiction context? So within science fiction, there's always, that, there's always that genre of truth. There's always that seed of where we take it and what we do. Next slide, please. So um, basically, what's the value of science fiction? And the value of science fiction to me has always been, it's a thinking machine. It allows you to think about the future and think about tourism and, and think about it in a very implausible way. It's that what if question in futures thinking and in scenario planning. And also the advantage of science, science fiction, it's, it's very visual, it's very impact. It's a big story, it, it's very colorful. So you can see what it is. And as they say, a picture is 10,000 words and more. It's a good genre to communicate a message. Next, next, please. So in the terms of why we did this book and, and what it's all about, we're living in a world at the moment of COVID-19 or we've gone through it. And when you have a dystopian scenario, a world, we from dystopia, you want to reimagine tourism. And what would that world look beyond COVID-19? And we can frame that in a science fiction paradigm. Next slide, please. So um, fundamentally, science fiction is a very broad genre. It's fundamentally a series of speculations. It's that what if question in, it could happen. It takes the essence of science, the seeds of science, things that are in the laboratory, and a lot of tech, and basically a lot of it's around technology. We take the concept of futurism. And that is Italian genre. A lot of science and technology in science fiction. So it's taking the stories of science and giving it a story, hence the title science fiction. Next slide, please. And to me, if you look at the very where we are with research in general in academia and tourism research in, in particular, it's all about academic outputs. We tend to think about what's plausible. So when you, you write in an academic paper, goes to review, you know, very much reviewers will turn around and say, is this plausible? Is this real? And so there we have we have research and tourism is, is bounded. We don't think the impossible. So how can you think the impossible? How can you think about these major events that would impact on tourism and how tourism would, would, would reshape in a very radical way? So to me, tourism research is constrained by, by plausibility. We don't think 
the impossible. And if you think the impossible, that's all about innovation and creativity and alternative paradigms for tourism. Next slide, please. So, and today we live in this world where it's full of uncertainty. Um, the, the world is about uncertainty, complexity. Um, where does, what is the future and how the distinction between the present and the future is very, very blurred. The world at the moment does not know where to go. It, it, it's, it's that uncertainty that we surround. And when we're predicting what, what will happen next year or the year after, it's, it's, it just, it's, it's, it's just I, I, basically I'm saying, I don't know where to go. What's the direction tourism would take? And that's even more impacted by what's happening in Ukraine today and the disruption that's going to be, do and how that war will unfold and the disruption on tourism more lo medium to long term in the terms of restructure. So what is the future of tourism is a very big question. Next slide, please. So basically, what is science fiction from a theoretical lens perspective? Well, it's, it's fundamentally about you need to explain the future. Science fiction is so, to many people, uncertain and unreal. It's not going to happen. But you, it's that what if question. From an ontological perspective, it's trying to explain something. So if science fiction is your story of the future, you're asking, what would be the circumstances and events that would lead to that? So it's not about forecasting the future. It's probably saying it's a, it's a backcast. So fundamentally, from an ornithology perspective, you explain the future. What if this could happen? So it's, it's something where it's about a series of assumptions rather than about strong truthfulness or strong or strong or strong strong amounts of evidence and you know the classical example of that if you've seen the film minority report this was steven field spielberg when he when he did this film he basically got 20 technologists and futurists together in a room and and said to them basically i i want to know the seeds of the future. I want to know what are some of the ideas you've got in your laboratory, and we could then portray them in Minority Report. Again, it's this imagination of how it could, could happen. And basically, this book is the Minority Report book about tourism research. Next slide, please. And that comes to about, if you're going to do a book on science fiction or a what if, what if thing, right at the heart of it is people have not got to believe you because there's got to be a degree of skepticism or fallacy or falseness in people's understanding of what the future is. If people say this can't happen, this won't happen, your scenarios are actually quite good. And that's right at the heart of the principles of what Jim Daytner says at the University of Hawaii. If you're going to do a good future set, one of your scenarios has to have, got to have a degree of skeptability, of skepticism of what it's all about. And we construct science fiction scenarios very much from very weak signals, you know, very uh, things that are very embryonic, very things that are starting in the terms of their smallness. Next slide, please. So, and, uh, you know, you, you've got to get your ideas from somewhere, and, and uh, Leon will go further into this, but to me, you know, I'm a great advocate of science fiction and, and, and films, you know, I like a good disaster movie or a good goody buddy type of film. And one of the films that portrays science fiction very well is Westworld, not just the new series, but the old series with y Yul Brynner. You know, this is about the robots that sort of become human and they fight and kill people. A good massacre, uh, uh, something about a massacre and death. And, but it's taking technology to the edges. But that technology that's in Westworld has a degree of truth. And it, it starts with basically Ray Kurzweil's work on the singularity is here. The point in the future when- Ian, the, you have one minute. When the power of, of robotics and are, are there. So, you know, Westworld's a really good thing. Final slide, please. So my final slide basically says, what is that theoretical lens? From a theory, from an ontological perspective, 
from an ontological perspective, um, science fiction is about you need to explain it. How could it happen? And, and what are the characteristics of science fiction research? Science fiction has to have is a good story or a narrative. It's based on it's based on skepticism. It has a degree of liminality in the terms of what's real and what's unreal, and it's, it's very blurred. Science fiction stories are very disruptive, but at the same time, a sense of transformation. And science fiction are also a plurality of futures. There's the science fiction world and the real world. It's like we're in the, the cosmos, the outer space, uh, that different alternative, that different alternative. More science fiction stories are based upon dystopia with a degree of utopia. But, this, you know, science fiction is basically, you know, it's, it's around dark tourism, death technology the bad side of the the bad side of the world but there's also a sense of there's a sense of authenticity about it when you talk to science fiction authors there's very much this is going to happen and when you look at so what's happening within the book in the book we fundamentally the book talks a lot about climate change and science fiction um, of where that that will go and Emily will come on to that and there's a lot about technology and bringing it into today's discourse, you can't escape that genre about COVID-19 and pandemics. So that's the essence of the book. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And we'll move on then to Leon. Leon, you're going to uh, give us uh, a presentation, La Life Without Limits. Excellent. Thank you. I'm hoping everyone can hear me fine. Um, uh, next slide, please. Actually, let's just jump straight in. Um, so the first thing I kind of wanted to say was apologies for this first slide. It's rather gratuitous, but um, there is a there is a reason that I that I put this 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 slide up as the first slide, which is there's a scene at the beginning or not at the beginning about uh, it's episode six of Westworld, in which um, Maeve an android walks through the area where everything is three D printed. Uh, where she sees the androids that, of which she is one of them. She sees the androids in the process of being made and she sees, you see this scene comes up and it's it's a moment in which actually the the male gaze, and I'm thinking of uh, the film theorist Laura Mulvey who talks about the male gaze and the ways in which uh, uh, female bodies are constructed to be looked at and male bodies are often constructed as, as the, the, uh, the driver of the action. The male gaze is subverted in this moment, and it's quite interesting because it's a moment where Maeve, as a, as an android, um, she becomes um, overtly the the driver of the action almost for the rest of the the narrative series, and she she loses all her illusions about the kind of world that she's living in all of a sudden. Um, so next slide, please. And what the, what's really interesting about this scene for me? So this is Maeve here, and she 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 walks through this this uh, place where she's seeing all the three D printed androids, and she she asks of the human handler that's with her, or handler, he's kind of terrified of her, but his name is Felix. She says, "Where am I?" And he says, "We're in design." So they're in the design department, um, and I thought this was a really really interesting moment for kind of laying bare the relationship between both design. Uh, science fiction and the and the notion of tourism as well, because this moment where Maeve, what she does is she walks in to, um, she is confronted by a, a full-size, almost kind of cinema screen-sized uh, 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 display, and she sees the branded, you know, packaging for Westworld. She sees this, you know, Westworld, discover your true calling, and she even sees herself in the kind of packaged, um, talk about, again, to talk about the male gaze in that kind of packaged Look at these. Look at these female sexual objects that you could come and shoot, or, or to to put it bluntly, rape, which is what is happening in this in this movie. These androids are are, are being um, uh, abused. So the interesting thing about this moment is actually it's it's it, for me it, it's an example for me of the way in which Westworld doesn't necessarily take. Um, the idea of a, a, a tourist fu future that's far in advance. It actually takes the ideas about tourism futures from where we already are. Um, Maeve's sudden shock is kind of the sudden shock of someone suddenly deciding or not suddenly realizing 
that they're an influencer with a hundred million people following them, right? There's a there's a moment in which she suddenly realizes that she's a packaged, consumed object, basically. Um, and this isn't this isn't an unusual scene, interestingly, in popular culture. Um, it's the, the first example of this that I've tracked in, in cinema is actually from 1900. There were two examples, one called Uncle Josh Goes to the Cinema and the other one called The Countryman and the Cinematograph. And it's a trope in media theory quite often referred to as the, the naive viewer, the moment at which your viewer is suddenly dispelled of their naivety when they suddenly realise that what they, they, they understand something new about the world um, that they hadn't before. Where you might have seen, if any of you have uh, been avid fans of Pixar or got children who've been avid fans of Pixar is, if we go to the next slide, is that almost every Pixar movie you've ever seen, just wait, yes, almost every Pixar movie you've ever seen actually hinges on this moment. It hinges on a moment where, where the toys realise that they're consumable objects, that they are toys that they're not actually, um, that they're not actually uh, 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 you know, individual human beings in that sense, and that the, the weird fantasy land around them is not, um, it's not what they thought it was. Um, and these are just a few examples. I could have given you loads and loads and loads. Um, so what's happening here is Maeve sees herself in relation to the branded tourist experience, and her consciousness is realized in direct relation to the notion of tourism as a designed experience. Um, and she understands herself as a consumable, consumed and consumer product. And that's when she gets angry. You know, it's, it's when, again, when the male gaze is subverted, when she suddenly realizes I'm going to take control of this, of this future and I'm going to start disrupting uh, this, 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 this tourist future or the tourist present for her. Um, and, and so for her to become sentient, she has to understand that her world in the her, her place in the world at that moment is not dissimilar to a kind of social media influencer allowing others to consume the the tourist experience via, you know via their packaged brand and and in this case she's literally being consumed because she ends up often dead and being resurrected so she's literally uh, often consumed to the point of, of the end of her life for that for that cycle. So, uh, as I said, her realization is a, a subversion of the male gaze. Now I want to jump to the, the the other really interesting aspect of Westworld, and I'll come back to this in a minute. So, if we can just flick onto the next slide. So, the other the other I think uh, really interesting um, uh, narrative, uh, or the other interesting trope in 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 Westworld for me is a is a harking back to. Um, Shakespeare's The Tempest, actually. It's a, it's, what happens is uh, Dr. John Ford, who is the, um, uh, no, sorry, Robert Ford. Robert Ford, who is the Anthony Hopkins character. He, he's literally kind of designing the androids, he's 3D printing them. He writes the code and scripts for both the psychology and the narratives of the hosts, right up until he sets them free. Now, in the first episode of, of Westworld, Peter Abernathy actually malfunctions and he states, hell is empty and all the devils are here. That's a quote from Ariel in the Shakespeare's The Tempest. The interesting thing about The Tempest is that um, The Tempest was, was Shakespeare's autobiographical uh, play. And it was, a, it was the only one that he didn't, he didn't pilfer the idea from someone else, but he made up entirely himself. And on, and on this island in, in The Tempest, um, Prospero is just like a playwright directing all of the characters. And so there's a direct kind of reference between Prospero and uh, 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 Robert Ford. And also, by the way, the fact that he's called Robert Ford, that it's a nod to John Ford, the, the movie director of Westerns. Um, so, so what happens here then is that essentially uh, Dr. Ford does exactly the same in Westworld as, as Prospero does in The Tempest, which is he's, he designs the action and he designs the, the narrative. Uh, in Westworld, it's interesting, there's a deliberate elision, I think, between the idea of scripting as in coding and scripting as in a, an act of theatrical authorship. There's a deliberate, there's a conversion of both of those things. So he scripts their psychologies, psychologies, and they also have their narrative, their words and their phrases written into their, their psychologies. Um, next slide, please. So what, what I think Westworld is doing is it's, it's implying that we, we are moving essentially from, uh, from a humanist world in which, uh, which was the world that Shakespeare was really contending with when he wrote uh, 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 The Tempest, was this world where we'd move from the idea of God uh, as being in, in power of the, the machinations of the world to, to humans and, and at that point to man understanding the kind of narrative 
the the sorry not the narrative the the physical um, uh, construction of the world how how the world how the laws of physics work basically so it, we, we move from kind of theistic to a humanistic uh, uh, world construction and what I think. Westworld does is it do, it it's implies the next move along. It implies that we're now moving to a post-humanist world. And what it suggests in this post-humanist world is that in a world where um, people want AI tourist experiences that are not just bound up in a kind of stage managed design simulations of the real, but they also often offer new avenues for simulating increasingly unreal experiences with high degrees of verisimilitude in which participants can uh, discover their real selves through the facilitation of safe anarchy. Um, and it also suggests that essentially um, these kinds of tourist futures that would be using AI would inevitably involve software engineering and a command over both narrative and ludology. These are terms that are used in game design, right? So the, the world construction and the narrative construction of how the characters behave within the world. Um, it suggests that tourist futures could more closely resemble hybrid services pre presently found in digital cultural production and design, as the line between digitally deployed algorithms and physical algorithms continue to blur further in, say, AI actors. Um, and it suggests that the kind of coders, programmers, and designers, and game developers could all be employed alongside scriptwriters and designers found in the film industry in actual tourist experiences. And I find this interesting because what it's doing is it's projecting forward and saying, how might all of these kinds of roles start to blur in tourism futures? Um, next slide, please. Leon, yeah, you've one minute. Great, I'm on my final slide, so that was that's worked well. Perfect. So. Um, so what can we conclude then here? Uh, I, I would say that what Westworld suggests is that increasing levels of automation and machine learning will de be deployed in, in the tourist industry because it already is. Um, so it's actually more an extrapolation than it is a kind of wild fantasy. Westworld doesn't point to where we'll end up so much as where we are already heading. Um, the tourist industries of have already gone radical change as a result of networked information and the capacity of automated the automated database and the algorithm to shape flows of tourism flows of tourism seeking out and consuming new experiences um, and added to this um, social media and their distributive power um, has been equally if not more powerful than the tourist industry's advertising e efforts in 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 recent decades um, I think that the, the journey Westworld invites us on is a thought experiment to consider what happens to the tourist industry when algorithmic automation continues to undergo as much change over the next couple of decades as it has over the previous decades. Um, and maybe this is me stretching it a bit far, maybe this is a bit painful, but I was struck by the fact that Unreal Gaming Engine, which is no longer, it doesn't even brand itself as a game engine anymore. Unreal Engine now brands itself as a real-time engine. Right. So which is so they've dropped the idea of the game because they're saying this is applicable across multiple industries in many, many ways. And I just thought it was really interesting that the Westworld logo and the Unreal Engine logo were very, very similar. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with that small bit of uh, uh, conspiracy theory. That's great, Leon. I shall never look at uh, Buzz Lightyear the same way again. <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you so much. Um, Folks, uh, do remember you can raise questions in the Q&A um, you know, as you go along and we can address those at the end. We're going to move on to Maria and to the destination of the dead. Thanks. Um, good morning or good evening, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So destination of the dead identifies a clear comparison between the impact of over tourism and the fictional impact of zombie boards. Even basic over-tourism solutions such as controlled entry are replicated in this, um, the genre in the forlorn hope of controlling the horde. Using a metaphor of tourists as zombies, it was intended to stimulate debate about the potential overwhelming negative impacts of over-tourism, if not match, managed correctly. Dresner in 2014 argued pop culture can provide creative alternatives to real-life issues, therefore could over-tourism be solved through the zombie genre. Um, next slide, please. So before we get into sustainability, there is a fundamental similarity between tourism and zombieism, as both cause an irreversible change in the participant or indeed the victim in the case of zombieism, this idea of the otherness of being. As a zombie hungers for brains, 
do we as tourists not hunger for experiences, adventures, a different way of life from our usual workday existence? Or even more simply, consider the suntan many tourists seek to acquire. This is a visible change to the skin of the person. Now consider how the skin of a zombie victim changes once they have been bitten and become infected. Uh, next slide, please. So this change does not only occur at a human level, but also occurs in the economy, social and cultural fabric environment of the host destination. In terms of environmental impact to Shaman in 2015, wrote about a slow moving cumbersome horde. He wasn't describing tourists in this scenario, but rather the undead. But as anybody who has been to a popular tourist destination can testify to, the slow moving cumbersome horde could easily be used to describe tourist crowds. Probably the most obvious example, and you'll see there um, in scenes from 28 Days Later and The Walking Dead, is the fragile degraded environments that exist in the zombie genre and are typically found in areas suffering from over-tourism. Interestingly, the makers of the TV version of The Walking Dead are now creating a new zombie series based in New York, a city ripe for over-tourism issues. And I should note that this new series is to be called Isle of the Dead, and we'll keep an eye on that because the title sounds rather familiar. Um, and looking at social and cultural impacts, the consumption of brains by a zombie is their main reason for existing, similar indeed to the conspicuous consumption by the tourists. And in the sort of bottom right hand corner, we have the toxoplasma gondii parasite. Um, and this change is typically found in cats and changes the um, attitude of cats effectively, and that makes them more susceptible or um, more willing to die, for want of a better term, but is there a non known force therefore activated by our necessary change in habitat when we become a tourist? And um, the changes our behaviour, making us more susceptible to dangerous activities or partaking in activities that we wouldn't normally partake in at home. Not discussed in the chapter, but one that does come up time and time again is perhaps enclave tourism. And does it is it reflected in some of the themes within the zombie genre? the local population replacing zombies as the protagonists in this scenario. The defended communities identified in the Walking Dead comics and TV show could easily be considered similar to all-inclusive resorts that employ gates, fences, and other security measures to keep the local population out, or in the case of the Walking Dead, to keep the zombies out. With regard to economic then, it's widely accepted that economic over-dependence upon tourism leaves regions as a significant risk of over-tourism. One only has to consider Iceland and its focus on tourism post-2008. By 2017, then, Iceland had become so dependent on tourism, it was considered to be at serious risk of over-tourism. Interestingly, in the World War Z book, um, it's very much identified that Iceland is overrun by zombies and can no longer be visited. Peter, in the original Dawn of the Dead, and this struck me as Leon was giving his presentation, this is a very similar quote. Peter, in the original Dawn of the Dead, suggests that when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Despite previous arguments by Beckerman in 1974, for example, the negative impacts of mass tourism will be felt in all destinations. Exclusivity is no longer guaranteed, and what was once wildly exotic is now very much commonplace. Next slide, please. So as George A. Romero, the, center, the guy there in the center amongst all the zombies, considered to be the godfather of the dead himself points out, zombie stories are a way of describing how the world responds to a global issue. The unprecedented growth in international tourism, how governments and populations react, is therefore perhaps the ultimate zombie story. Um, I would note that the chapter was written pre-COVID, and that as we emerge from this pandemic, over-tourism is not a primary concern for destinations. However, level of latent demand in the marketplace would suggest that poor tourism may soon raise its ugly head again. And it's now the time for destinations to be tackling the issue before it becomes a problem again. One potential solution copied from the zombie genre, genre would be to leave honeypot destinations to the tourists and establish local communities elsewhere. Something similar to the Red Ecker plan as discussed in the World War Z book. Just as the characters in zombie stories cannot escape the relentless words of undead, Destinations cannot escape the unstoppable march of the tourist. And for many destinations, this may inevitably lead to over tourism. Once a zo zombie horde is released, it's very difficult to control, just like tourism. So, brought it in under time, Una, just to keep things moving. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. 
And we're going to move on now to Emily. Yes, great. So hi all, you can, you can hear me, right? Yes. I'm, I'm sending you greetings from the lobby of the Hotel Anthropocene. I asked the hotel manager to empty the lobby and I said, I told the manager, like, I'm one of the authors of this wonderful, inspiring book. So, yeah, so that's why there's no people behind me. Um, so my name is Emily Höcket and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Lapland in, in Finland. And I have written this chapter uh, with Professor Martin Gren from Linné University in Sweden. And as um, many of you might know, uh, Martin has been doing this pioneering work on, on tourism in the Anthropocene. Uh, well, in short, Anthropocene refers to the current epoch where humans interfere with the geological and biological processes of the world to a greater extent at a faster rate than ever before. Uh, and well, I want to say also that today Martin and I are both part of this research group called uh, Interliving in the Anthropocene, financed by the Academy of Finland, where we explore the potentialities of proximity in tourism. And well, I could say a little bit about my background is that my previous research has explored especially the ethics of hospitality and ethics of care and how different kind of hosts, both human and non-human, uh, welcome and take care of each other in tourism settings. So when our paths crossed, when Martin and I met, uh, we, can, we began to weave together this fictive, speculative and somewhat apocalyptic story about the Hotel Anthropocene. Um, I wanted to show you, I'm thinking, can you see, I have this something happening with the lobby here. I wanted to, <laughs> no, you can't see it. How should I do it? Whatever, what I want to show you is that our chapter is written as a script. Uh, so there are all together six different scenes. Um, and I uh, want to say warm thanks to the editors and also to Sarah for uh, encouraging us to, to test this kind of experimental writing. And it feels like this book is a very good home for, for our story. Um, well, I do not want to reveal too much about the plot line. I'm thinking that uh, when our script is turned into a movie, I hope that there are many movie producers uh, following the event today. Um, so I think that the movie trailer will most likely present uh, a scene um, of this big overbooked all-inclusive hotel. And uh, there are very like different kind of guests. There are people who are traveling under different kind of premises. Uh, there are tourists who are fleeing their daily routines and responsibilities. And then there are also climate refugees that have been forced to flee their home to seek for safety. Um, perhaps uh, the trailer could also show, there's, uh, there's a screen in this lobby, um, a screen with a blinking red text uh, that tells that different parts of the hotel system is, are actually going down. Um, the trailer could uh, include um, uh, an image of the infinity pool that has run out of water. So, uh, so no swimming in there. There are also these half, half empty buffet, ta buffet tables that are upsetting the guests. So we're expecting a lot more. Um, however, at the same time, there are also most likely people dancing and singing, I don't know, Despacito maybe. That would be still, uh, everybody knows that. Uh, in the bar and trying to ignore the worrying signs and also the ever more pressing atmosphere. So that I think this would be more or less the, what our uh, movie trailer will look like. Um, so not really revealing more, uh, but I would like to point out that when we were writing the script, um, we felt uneasy about the characters in our story whose thoughts contradicted them and also contradicted others around them. And we discussed quite a lot about this feeling of uneasiness that we, we were feeling. And it's, 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 it's clear that contemporary tourism is filled with these awkward paradoxes that echo worldviews that are no longer tenable in the midst of environmental crisis. Well, there's a, what I mentioned, what, what the trailer would probably also present the inequalities in global mobilities, there are climate refugees, um, and also, as we know, the current situation, uh, people leaving their homes for different reasons. 
Um, then, but we co still continue to fly for lesser, uh, although it accelerates climate change. There's the phenomenon of last chance tourism, for example, here in the Arctic. Um, the, uh, we're keen to experience uh, vulnerable landscapes before it's too late. And, and it seems like we have the needed knowledge, knowledge, but we choose to act in harmful ways. And as the editors point out in the introduction of the book, and as Ian just described, um, science fiction enables us to engage with this speculative storytelling. And it also enables us to grasp this kind of contradictions, awkward paradoxes and contradictions in our own ways of being and knowing and also conducting research. So I said, I see that instead of trying to hide or overlook this, uh, this un feelings of uneasiness or contradictions in general, or to pretend that we know exactly what is happening and what we should do, it enables us to slow down and, well, what Donna Haraway says, to stay with the trouble. Do I still have a uh, few minutes? Yes, yes. Uh, so I see that our chapter is also a small contribution in this larger project of exploring what our research does and how we can engage with different forms of storytelling to speculate and envision different kinds of futures. And also to ask the question, how these different ways of sharing information and telling stories about the climate crisis, biodiversity loss, overuse of resources and so on. How do these stories and narratives attune us? How do they make us feel and how do they make, make us act? Is it possible that they paralyze us? And how we, are we being moved by different kinds of stories? And not least, how we should, as researchers, position ourselves in these stories. Um, and our chapter is in the dystopia, I can't pronounce that, dystopia, right? Dystopia section of this book. And it definitely belongs there. It's an apocalyptic story. Uh, however, although we're telling this kind of apocalyptic story, we are by no means convinced that this is the way we should engage with the storytelling in the Anthropocene. So I think it's, the, I, uh, I, and I think this is also something we should think about with, with our teaching, that what, what it is, how does it attune us when we tell this kind of apocalyptic stories? So as my final words, I want to welcome you to visit our chapter and visit the Hotel Anthropocene uh, and to critically reflect with us on tourism in the context of planetary ethics. And well, I also want to mention that at the end of the chapter, you can find added, this added leaflet companion where we offer further explanation about the meanings of the different scenes and also summarize some of the readings that have been guiding our imaginaries when we'll be writing, writing the story. So movie producers and others, uh, you can get my contact details from the editors. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And uh, we'll certainly keep that in mind when you're up for your, your BAFTA award or, or whatever, and make sure we get a, 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 front, a seat in the front row for that one. So that one was excellent. Thank you. Folks, um, unfortunately, Mariana can't be with us this evening, but uh, Ian is going to speak on her behalf for the last uh, presentation this evening. Ian? Next slide, please. Um, good morning. Right. Okay. Right. I'm Mariana. Um, I'm the good-looking one. Uh, only kidding. Um, right. I think when we did this book, it's it goes back to what I said at the, at the beginning, and I think it's the power of science fiction um, within the genre of, of tourism of tourism research and how we see research going at the moment. How we see go research going at the moment. Because science fiction, to a certain extent, is an art, and it, it, therefore it's quite a powerful tool to see different things. Because very much when we doing tourism research, we, we tend to be very much narrowed. It's like we're on railway tracks. Journal articles that are very much accepted in the, the top tier journals have to be of a certain genre or a certain type, um, so that you know. For example, at the moment, there's journals like very quantitative papers and quantitative papers from a few perspective can only go into a very short term very short term changes and tourism academics seem to be writing very narrowly and tourism academics seem to be all right 
very much all writing on the same thing uh, in the way we approach. We tend not to look at tourism in different lenses or with, or, or with different hats. So science fiction is an art. It, it's very abstract. It allows us to see different things and it empowers us to frame the future very differently. Very much science fiction, because it's unstructured, it's uncertain. It lets you paint a, a different canvas of what the future is. Because many of us as stakeholders who are involved in tourism have to take decisions that are politically acceptable. We tend not to think about the unacceptable or the unimagined. And the thing with tourism at the future and the future of tourism, it's changing, it's coming rapidly. So for example, we explored some of the, the ideas that Leon's brought up in Westworld. When do they actually come true? Not explaining them, but when do they come true and what's its impact and what its impact? So art is a different thinking tool. Art is a different cognitive lens for science fiction. It tells us different things from different systems perspective and different behaviors. So for example, if we think of the genre of tourism ethics, if we think about what is ethical today, it may not be eth ethical tomorrow. Something that's ethical today may be unethical in the future and vice versa. So even understanding ethics at a very basic level, is where we can take science fiction, thinking the impossible and thinking out of the box and reshaping boundaries. Next slide, please. So science fiction is something, it, as it's a narrative, it's putting you fundamentally into the role of I or the person. It's you, if, it's you as if you're being transformed you, you t you're going into this world, you're going right into the, the center of the book. You, you know, you are the person in the hotel that Emily was talking about. You are the person in the Harry, po in the Harry Potter story that um, Ina, Ina Reckenberga talks about. You are the person that's immersed. So you tend to look at things from the first, from the person, the eye, and where it's, it's where it's going and what it's, what it's doing. And again, it goes back to science fiction and tourism. Basically, it's what I talk about in terms of its liminal state. It's already here, but it's a matter of consciousness and how we understand it. To many of us, we will reject science fiction. But anyway, but very much many of the elements of science fiction are here for us to explore. And the, the key one that's happening very quickly at the moment, if you just take a look at the theories, um, or the, or the kits that surround the metaverse. The metaverse is this alternative world. The metaverse is something where you can visit. It, it's your avatar. It's this different world of where we're going in the terms of what you do. So you can explore things. You, because tourism, to a certain extent, is away from the daily routine of your daily life. You go on holiday to do all of the things you can't do in your normal life. As they say in Vegas, if it happens in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. And that's what the metaverse is. It's this alternative world with a different identity, different games, different genre, where a different personality that you've got comes out in the terms of doing things. So science fiction is a different way to explore the future of tourism. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much to all our presenters. Um, there's an opportunity now, folks, to um, ask uh, some questions of our panel. Um, but maybe if I could ask a question, uh, first of all, Ray Bradbury considers science, science fiction as the most important um, literature in the history of the world because it is the history of ideas. What are or what are your ideas from science fiction? for tourism and the future of tourism. Who would like to take that one? Ian, do you want to jump in? Repeat the question, Una, please. Sure. Ray Bradbury considers science fiction as the most important literature in the history of the world because it is the history of ideas. So what are your ideas from science fiction for tourism and the future of tourism? Well, I think um, 
that's what that's what the central purpose of the book is. You know, the central purpose of the book is 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 full of ideas, um, and there's a couple of things that resonate from me. So, for example, I I, I love Marianne's chapter on destination of the dead. It just it just hit a, it just hit a button with me, in the terms of I think about all of those tourists that would wander around Venice, and it's about how it, it, it's about seeing Venice in, in two hours. It's where we we become engrossed in what we want to see, but we don't see it. And also, to, to actually tourists when they go on on holiday, to a certain extent, I've, I've got this thing: tourists never look, tourists never engage because they're on their mobile phone and they're engaged with something else. They never they're never switched off. So tourists as zombies is the very passive. Tourists as zombies, they're very passive. They're not, they're not immersive. And if we look to the future of tourism, you know, everybody's talking about regenerative tourism, where it's a lot more immersive, engaging with the destination, taking on the characteristics of the destination. You're not the tourist, but you are, you're a temporary, temporary resident. And to a certain extent, mass tourism has been about this wandering around, not noticing things, uh, and going, for, going from A to B. In the terms of like that so that's what some of the good writings that are that are coming out of this and there's another chapter by Ina Reckenberger which she talks about um Harry Potter and you know it, it, it Harry Potter in the way Harry Potter is a good person Harry Potter is about um challenging the impossible coming over Fight, fighting the dragons and, and fighting evil but coming out at the end and to a certain extent that's what tourism is and how it's ha it's having ha having to fight M many people see tourism uh, as an evil as something bad in society but actually tourism is for the good of society and it's it's part of the sol it's part of the solution but not of the problem and we as tourism leaders and tourism stakeholders is about taking that good fight um and, and the benefits of tourism to many communities so they're the two of the things that resonate from me from from the book Leon, you had some really interesting ideas uh, looking at Westworld and technology, et cetera. Um, what ideas there do you see um, becoming more prevalent in the future as we, we I suppose, develop experiences uh, in tourism? Well, actually, I was going to I was going to go on. I, I was tempted to, to, to put my hand up there, so I'm glad you asked, because mm -hmm. uh, because it follows on from what Ian was just saying. Actually, I, one of the things I think is really interesting about Westworld is um, it 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 suggests it suggests two things at the same time. It suggests an escape, which of course tourism has always been an escape, right? It's always been a. It's almost like if you look at it from a depressingly economic unit, you you're buying you're buying yourself free time out of the labour market to spend not doing work, right? But but then at the same time, it mixes it with 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 the the. The actually having to do work. So, so Westworld's a difficult, brutal, you know, a little bit like going on a really miserable tramp in New Zealand in the rains, maybe, or, you know, like it's kind of, you, it's actually hard in some ways. There's some of it that's hard. Um, and I think what's interesting is uh, be, it, what it suggests is that there's a capacity to leave behind. What I think is interesting about Westworld is the capacity to leave behind the 21st century actually that, that that you've got this hyper futuristic ai robots at the same time as you're going into the 18th century you don't have phones you've got to leave your phones at the door and i could well imagine that kind of thing the the thing where how do we get people more engaged well construct a situation in which the phone is not available i mean i actually think it's probably one of the reasons why hiking is so popular in new zealand is uh, and uh, every time I go hiking, you turn up in huts and there is a discussion every time about the fact that no one can get phone signal and that's a good thing. Um, and I think there'll be concerns when you finally can get your phone signal wherever you are. Um, and then, interestingly, there was an Ian Banks uh, novel I read years and years ago in which he, you know, uh, people would go on, they would go rock climbing and leave their communicators behind so that there was no way of, of being, you know, and, and so I think there'll be an aspect of the disconnection as well, um, which follows on from what Ian was saying. But of course, the very powerful, I would say this because I'm you know, a photographer and visual theorist as well as a designer. And I see the tourist gaze as just being so profoundly powerful. Um, uh, how, how you 
manage the the need for people on social media to to prove that they've been somewhere with the disconnecting from technology i don't know how you manage that but it, it strikes me that there's multiple competing demands in tourism always probably it's a really interesting point um and um maybe uh maybe looking further um Emily, uh, particularly in that whole area of sustainability and ethics and environmentalism um, and what's happening um, at the moment, uh, I suppose post uh, COVID, where we, we had to rethink uh, what we were, what, the way we were consuming tourism. Have you any further thoughts there about uh, the way forward in certain destinations or, or more globally across the world? Mm, it's a <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, we're, as I said, mentioned earlier, we are now uh, exploring the possibilities of proximity tourism and kind of exploring um, the mundane in new ways. And uh, I've, I've I've been now when I've been listening to you, I've been like thinking like ding ding ding. How could we con kind of connect the, the science? fiction and uh, with the, uh, the kind of storytelling with the, with, prox with the idea of proximity. And I think I have to continue uh, with that. Uh, I don't know. I think what, I, I, what I, I'm, I'm taking um, with me, like reading this book, and I'm thinking like, it's so important also, not only for researchers, but also for, for students to read it kind of this, um, what you said about the speculation and not knowing kind of the humbleness that comes with that, that we kind of, it, it's a cliche, but that we have to work together. Um, but it's kind of, it, it's a good starting point to kind of um, and, uh, very nice and, and confess that we do not, we do not really know. Uh, so it is, um, yes. So kind of have this open endings. So I don't. I I I think I'm I'm kind of careful. I don't think I would like to suggest this uh, <laughs> kind of uh, answers, and I don't have any easy answers. But I think in general, like kind of this open endedness, um, kind of fascinates me. And I think open endedness is good because it makes us uh, think and explore. So uh, mm. thank you, you Emily, for that. And Maria. Um, zombies, do you, do you still think we will need those uh, zombie horde techniques um, uh, in destinations in the near future? Uh, yeah, I do. I think there is there's the latent demand in the market um, for tourism. So I think over tourism is still very much an issue that has to be addressed. Um, and even if you were, for example, going to an all-inclusive resort in the Bahamas this summer, you might consider how that would, um, you know, how that is replicated in the zombie genre. So actually it always has sort of been there. It's just about how, you know, now that we've identified it, and touched on the, uh, an important point about that passivism amongst tourists and how then that is replicated in the slowly moving, shuffling, shambling world of zombies. You can easily imagine the slowly moving, shuffling, jamming horde of tourists going through Barcelona or Venice or any of those sort of destinations that would be synonymous with over tourism. So mm -hmm. I think there is always a lesson to be learned from, um, I suppose, not just zombieism, but in terms of science fiction and that idea that, you know, by tapping into pop culture, whether it is science fiction or whatever it may be. You can create, you know, alternatives, creative alternatives to real life issues. Okay, thank you. We have one question from our attendees, uh, from Martin. And Martin is saying, thinking of one segment of a possible scenario quadrant, will tourism exist when the monetary economy no longer exists, i.e. that the tyranny of tourism will longer be required? What replaces tourism? Wow, that's a deep one, uh, Martin. Um, Anyone, any thoughts on that? Ian, any can thoughts I, on that? I can have a go. Um, just the thing. So basically, we talk about tourism as a monetary system, or we talk about tourism as, as an economic system. And I think uh, tourism without economics means tourism has failed as a business. 
Um, so all of us are academics. Um, we're, all, we're all involved in tourism management or tourism business. So we'd, we, we would be in a world of collapse. If you don't have tourism from an economic system, tourism does not does not exist because there is a monetary value with it for businesses to be in business with it. I think the important question that Martin raises is how do we view tourism? And to me, it's what the value of tourism is because tourism is more than economics. It's its value in the terms of human capital, social capital, um, and, and tourism and its relationships to technology. So looking at the value of system, and because fundamentally we measure tourism from an economic perspective, and I think there has to be a strong movement to move tourism, tourism out of that system in the terms of its measurement and its success and its impact. And it has to be against, against other criteria and how we understand tourism and how we discuss tourism. But economics is one of the criteria that will not disappear because otherwise there will not be any business for tourism. And if you don't have the business of tourism, you don't have tourism employment. And many destinations that are dependent on tourism would disappear. And Martin has come back and he said, it's one quadrant. The future of tourism could be multidisciplinary and its survival is beyond economics. Definitely. Thank you. So uh, that's that's uh, good thoughts there, folks. Um, if I could ask maybe one last question to get you to to reflect, folks, um, if you were to write your chapters again um, and where we are at the moment, what would you change or what would you add? Um, this, is, this is for edition number two, by the way. But what would true. you change and what would you add? I was I was I mean, I. I I don't know if I'd change or add anything, which is going to sound incredibly arrogant, but I did really want to jump in on the last question. So um, <laughs> can I can I just quickly say about the just in, in addition to what Ian asked about the uh, Ian said about the whether tourism exists or not? There's a lot of there's a number of science fiction writers. I'm thinking Kim Stanley Robinson and Ian Banks both write about what what happens in a world where where a monetary system is no longer necessarily uh, functional, but people still move around. There's, there's still the idea that they move around and they still, and I think people will always want to move around because as we, as any paleontologist will tell you, we're, we've fundamentally been a migratory species for, for a long, long time. So I, I think, I think if you, if you look at tourism as an economic function, then yes, but um, I can't imagine people not continuing to want to move around and to experience other cultures. And um, it will be, it, that would be a form of tourism in one way or another. And, and, and the, 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 again, I always find myself going back to what we've already got right now. Uh, and what we've got right now is I've got a whole load of friends who are in the tech industry in the, on the West coast of America, and they're often not in, no longer in the West coast of America. They're, they're working all over the world. Um, and it's a form of tourism while they work. Um, you know, if you if you're living in Sri Lanka or Bali or whatever, while you while you're sending your code back to San Francisco, that's that's still a form of tourism while you're working. So I would say the boundaries would potentially just continue to shift on what it is. Anyway, that's me spent my time. So I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks, Leon. Uh, Maria, any thoughts? Yeah, I think I'll actually probably make mine wider than just zombies and maybe look at it from the entire horror genre, maybe a book, an entire book in itself. I made a throwaway comment in the chapter about how you could look at vampire-based, um, the genre of vampires and how they replicate the thing in particular Lost Boys, that tagline, party all night, sleep all day, and whatever the New Zealand equivalent of Ibiza would be for young people, where they would go on holidays and party all night, sleep all day. They've actually effectively become vampire tourists. And the other one I really would want to write about is Jaws. And I use this in with my first years because if you look at Jaws and sustainability, you know, you have the economic the economic argument for keeping the beaches open from the mar and the towns, the business people in the town, regardless of you know the impact on the social cultural that there's potentially some of your population are going to be eaten. And then you have that environmental you know, the shark is simply doing what a shark does and it just happens to coincide it with the holiday destination. And even then, if you really are getting into it, you know, look at Alien and no one in space can hear you scream. You know, as Richard Brown 
Johnson and some of those others begin to go up into space, are we then, you know, you're in space tourism and that opens a whole, another book for sure, Ian, on space tourism and the future of it. Um, so I think, yeah, I would probably look at it from a wider horror point of view. Okay, thank you. And Emily, would you add anything to your chapter? Um, I don't know if I, I would have to ask Martin also. <laughs> uh, I think we could have continued to re-re-rewrite it, but I think now when we read it, uh, re-read it as the very first, and I think we were pretty happy with it. I don't know if we, hopefully that outside reader also, that we're able to kind of welcome the reader to the story. Um, uh, but I, I think I would, but this was a kind of, it, it was an experiment, which was surprisingly scary, uh, or kind of that it is, it, it, it was a, it was a really, really nice to write uh, this different kind of text. And I think I would like to continue with it. But and I, uh, I think you're, uh, yes, I, I don't know how to, how to explain it more, but I think we were kind of uncertain what we were actually doing. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm happy. I hope there's going to be the, the next book also. <laughs> uh, what Absolutely. I to also, <laughs> the, about the, uh, what the, the kind of the definition, how we understand tourism, I'd just like to con go back to that a little bit. You, you, you mentioned you editors, uh, the traveling in time and, and, and maybe like kind of what, what we, how we understand that we understand like, uh, tourism so much in terms of um, physical mobility and then what would it be like this on like micro movements ontological shifts or uh, kind of thinking about time traveling kind of what what happens uh, here among us closer to us and I think there is something I, I think we also need to be ready to kind of disrupt the little bit more the definition of tourism what how we understand what tourism is and I think we're also forced to do that in the in the future brilliant thank you and ian last comment briefly from you um if i was to do the book all over again and actually we, we've been thinking about ideas and what we should do what, one of the things i'd probably talk about is weak signals i'd probably do something on technology that hasn't been invented yet but it has been invented yet and the characteristic of, of that is it's technology that hasn't become mainstream. And where we get those ideas, for example, we would look at paintings. So, for example, uh, the, digi the digital camera, the first paintings by Kodak, was in 19 1972, 1972. But it didn't come to fruition until the 1990s and what we got. So if you look at paintings uh, um, uh, and where they are and what they do and how far you take, take them. So I probably have some sort of... Um, I probably have some sort of chapter on Terminator and Arnold Schwarzenegger and would relate it back to the work of Boston Dynamics and what they're doing with, with, with military robots uh, and where they are today and what they will be like in 50 years time would be something very different. So that, that Terminator Arnie, Arnie film um, would, would, would probably be me. I can see you as Arnie. Yes, indeed. Anyway, folks, um, it's time now to bring the session to a close. I think you'll agree with Vic Sport some of the diversity and the creativity of science fiction. And uh, given that present context of COVID-19, war in Ukraine, the disruptive effects of technology, I think we can certainly see how science fiction has aspects of truthfulness uh, in it. So huge thanks to our fantastic speakers uh, this evening, to Ian, Leon, Maria and Emily, and to all our wonderful contributors and to the book itself, and you'll see them listed on the slide. Uh, thanks also to Channel View uh, Publications. Thanks to Louise, you were uh, brilliant in the background there moving the slides and for all the technical and organization or organizational aspects um, behind the webinar and thank you for that. And don't forget folks uh, about the discount offer of 40% off all the books in the Tourism Future series. So you've got the code FOT 2022. And if you go onto the Channel View website uh, and that is valid until the end of March. Um, so thank you very much um, and I hope you have enjoyed this session and onwards to the next edition. Thank you.